Did you know that sometimes Christians can be absolutely wrong? They can just get it wrong. Have you ever seen a Christian post something on Facebook, comment on a current event, or just downright hate Halloween for no good reason? And you just feel like, man, sometimes Christians are just too much, man. They're just too much. They're doing too much right now. Like, like maybe it's just me, but, but I feel that way very often. See, what I want to do is I want to open up the Bible. I want to read from John's gospel to set the pace for today's talk. Check this out. John chapter one, starting verse one, it says this. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Check this out. Let's skip to verse 14. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father. Check this part out. Full of grace and truth. Full of grace and truth. If Jesus came full of grace and truth, then we as Jesus followers should be full of grace and truth. Unfortunately, we don't always get it right. So our last part of our four-part series called In God We Trust, you can title this message, When Christians Get It wrong. Pray with me wherever you are. God, help us. Help us to get it right. Help us to be the light that shines into the darkness. Help us to be full of grace and truth like you, Jesus. Help us to unite a divided world, Lord. Help us to be a solution and not a problem. We're going to get it right through your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Man, we're gonna get it right. Just type it in your comments. Get it right. Just type it in your comments because we are gonna get it right up in here. Okay, so for years now, for years, this country, our country, has been known as a Christian nation, right? And most of us would, would agree with that. God bless the USA and such and such, you know. Unfortunately, today, however, for a growing number of Americans, um, we would not be considered a Christian nation anymore. There's a large percentage of people that would actually identify as post-Christian, that would identify as a post-Christian. Now, to bring that in context, that does not necessarily mean someone is an agnostic. It doesn't mean that someone is necessarily an atheist either. Um, a post-Christian is someone who has had some form of connection with Christianity. This could be that they were either uh, christened or, or baptized when they were, were younger. They might have been confirmed in the church. They might have gone to a Christian school. Uh, and they, they, might go to, they might go to church on, a, on a special occasions like Christmas or Easter. A post-Christian is someone who has had exposure to Christianity but they have chosen to reject it. Chosen to reject it. And it's not that they don't know. The problem is they know about Jesus, but, but they just don't really care. They, they don't see it as beneficial for our world. It's what we would consider post-Christian. Now, when I was a youth pastor in Virginia Beach, I remember I was constantly working with students uh, whose parents were not church people. That was, we had a big reach to, to that demographic. You know, we averaged around 350 high school and middle school students between our, our midweek ex experiences and our, and our weekend service experience. And, and most of those students that came in were from unchurched or post-Christian family backgrounds. So, you, so the problem that we had, um, that, my, that my team had, was that we had a lot of Christian parents who, who, who were regular attenders of our church who did not want their kids hanging out with bad, secular students that our program was attracting. 
Here's the thing though, I really didn't care. I didn't give a rip at all, to be honest. And, and so what I continued to do was I continued to throw dance parties at our church. I threw crazy Halloween events. I did water balloon fights. Uh, I gave out free food constantly in order to reach a post-Christian generation. And guess what? It worked. It worked. People, young people who had no exposure, limited exposure to Christianity found a life-giving relationship through Christ. See, because wherever the light goes, lives are completely changed by Jesus. So for a long time, we considered our nation a Christian nation. Now, like I said, I don't really think we are anymore. I think faith in Jesus has often move where it once was in the center of our nation is more on the fringes and, and it shifted from being something that people see as a positive to I think majority but people see Christianity as a as a threat or, or even a problem. In fact, the term Christian doesn't mean a lot to a, a lot to people that it meant years ago. And if you're even called an, an evangelical Christian, that that's been interpreted to be someone who's mean who's hateful, bigoted, judgmental, and a full-blown Christian. And in our post-Christian world, we'll probably even label that person as someone who's very, very dangerous. The question that I want to raise to us today is this. How do we faithfully represent Christian and represent Jesus in a post-Christian culture? How do we faithfully represent Jesus in a post-Christian culture? Culture. If we're followers of Jesus, how do we represent him in a way that honors God, dignifies people in a culture that's becoming more hostile to Jesus, more anti-God? And I think you would agree with me that we're in a very politically divided time. Uh, we, we see a lot of division, and I'm going to, here's the truth. When the world is divided, the church must be united. The church must be united. It doesn't matter who's in office. It doesn't matter what your political preference is. Our mission as Jesus followers never, ever changes. It never changes. And what is our mission, you may ask? What is the mission of the church? If you look at John 1, 14, our mission, you could say, is this. We're called to live in love with grace and truth. We're called to live in love with grace and truth. In fact, let's look at this one more time. The, in John 1, 14, it says, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us as Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. We have seen the glory, uh, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth truth, full of grace and truth. He was full of grace and truth. He was full. You may know someone who's full of something and it ain't grace and truth. Don't comment what you think they're full of, but, but, but it ain't all right. See, when Jesus came, he was full. In fact, I like the Greek translation of this word. It's the word we see in the Greek is play race, which just means filled to the brim, abound, abounding in, thoroughly full. It's kind of like the illustration, the best illustration is like if you have a, a glass of water that's literally filled to the brim, <clears throat> um, if you just jiggle a little bit, guess what? It's flowing over out. It's overflowing. It's falling out. And if you get anywhere close to Jesus or the people of Jesus, I want you to get this, we should be so full of grace and truth when people press against us, grace and truth overflows from us. Not stupid Facebook comments, not mean name calling, not things that are tearing people down, but grace and truth should overflow from you if you are a Christ follower, if you're someone who considers a, to be a follower of Jesus. When you're pressed or or push or things don't go the way you want Jesus and his character and his response and his compassion and his love and his grace and truth should overflow from you what's overflowing from you what's overflowing from your life why does it matter that he came full of grace and truth why does it matter it matters because grace saves and truth frees 
Grace saves and truth frees. What does grace do? Grace saves. What does truth do? Truth frees. Then we as followers of Jesus should be full of grace and truth. The problem is we often haven't got it right. We haven't got it right, friends. I know I haven't got it right. In fact, if you ever find yourself saying, man, I don't like Christians sometimes. Sometimes Christians bother me. They drive me crazy. Guess what? I'm with you. Half of them drive me crazy too, man. I'm telling you. And the reason is because often we live, Christians live in one of two extremes. They live in one of two extremes. We live either on the extreme side of truth or we either, or we either live in the extreme side of grace. And Jesus didn't come with just one. He came with both. What we would call in the vineyard is, is, is the radical middle. We believe that Jesus is in the, is in the middle of, of these things. Not so far this side or so far that side, but in the middle. Take truth. Some of you, truth is great. Truth sets you free. Truth is powerful. But some Christians, if they're all truth, if they're only truth, have you noticed that the Christians that are only truth tend to be kind of mean? They seem to be mean. They seem to kind of be out of touch with culture, and they seem to be judgmental. If they're all truth, and they're all kind of like, you need truth, brother. You need to have the truth in you because the truth was such a free. Like, like you're like, yo, man, you, you, what's going on? You know, what you doing? And they're like, hey, man, they ain't dressing right. They ain't dressing right. They ain't behaving. They're smoking that funny smelling cigarette. They, I mean, they, they, they need the truth. They need to know the truth because if they don't know the truth, they're going to burn in hell where there's crying and the gnashing of teeth. Like, they need the truth. Like, whoa, whoa, dude. Whoa. You need to take a chill pill. You know? You know? You know? How many of you know someone like that or have seen Christians who come across like that? Just judgmental, mean, mean spirited, just, 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 you know, just man, like, are you sure you're following Jesus? Are we reading the same Bible? But then you got the other side. Here you go. You got the other side, though, where it's just all grace, where it's all grace. And these people are like, oh, you know, oh, it's, it's so, you sin. Oh, you got, you got habitual sin in your life. Oh, it's okay. It's okay. Oh, I got moral failures, too. Oh, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm a sinner too. Save by grace. Oh, save. Wait, grace. I, oh, you hear that? Save by grace. You know, it's like, what? like whoa, dude. Like, like, are you just floating around on the grace cloud? I don't even know. Maybe that's not a grace cloud you're floating on right now. See, it's, if it's all grace but no truth, it creates two extremes. And these two extremes create big problems and it leaves the world that we're trying to reach for Jesus confused. It leaves the world confused and it makes Christians look irrelevant and it makes Christianity look like something that people do not need. I want to talk to you for a moment about these problems because this is how Christians often don't get it right. The first problem is this. Problem number one, truth without grace leads to rebellion. Truth without grace leads to rebellion. If, it's, if we're just truth, 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 and no compassion, no understanding, no love, no grace, people reject, people reject that and people rebel hard against that. If you ever want to see Christians get it wrong, you know, like, like I said, I'm, I was a youth pastor. I, I worked with a lot of families in, in, in my time. If you ever see a really religious, legalistic home, what you almost always see from the children is rebellion. And what you almost always see from the parents is, is hypocrites. They're just hiding their sin. <laughs> it's a hiding. It's, a, it's, it's just a whole family that just hides everything. And you, and you can, all, like I said, you can almost guarantee rebellious children. And if you lead your family with rules and religion without a relationship with God, it's truth without grace. It leads to rebellion. And that's one extreme. The other problem you see is grace without truth. It's grace without truth. And what does that do? Problem number two, grace without truth leads to relativ relativism. What is relativism? It's, it's you can do whatever you want without any kind of standards. You can do whatever you want and there are no standards, which is the belief that there is really no such thing as absolute truth. 
And if there's no such thing as af absolute truth, then your truth is your truth, then my truth is my truth, and my truth may say this, and your truth may say that, but it doesn't matter because there's no absolute truth. And therefore, since there's no truth, you can't tell me, and God can't tell me how to live because there's no such thing as absolute truth. So grace without truth leads me to the conclusion that it doesn't really matter what you do as long as you're happy. It doesn't really matter what you believe as long as you're sincere. It doesn't really matter how long you do something, whatever you do, if it's not really hurting people because grace without truth, there's love and there's acceptance, which is all good, but there's no definitive standard. So your standard may actually offend and hurt and be problematic to the heart of God. How do we respond today to this? How do we respond? Unfortunately, what's really common and what I see is a philosophy that will be known as just get a little bit of Jesus. Get you a little bit of Jesus philosophy. Get a little bit of Jesus. This is a little. This is a small dose of Jesus is enough to make you feel better about yourself and get you by. Watch a little Instagram clip, a little Facebook clip of a, of a preacher preaching for about a minute and 14 seconds. Maybe like it if you really thought it was good. You know, maybe send a, the, the amen, praising hands, emojis if you really like it. Watch church online every once in a while when you feel like waking up, even though it's on demand, you can watch it anytime. Um, just get a little bit of Jesus. Get enough Jesus to make you feel better about yourself, but not enough to really make a difference. Not enough to really change you. It's just, it's just a little bit of Jesus. Here you go, friends. When Jesus came, he came with grace and truth, full of grace and truth. Therefore, as followers of Christ, we are called to live in love with grace and truth. What does grace do? Grace saves. What does truth do? Truth frees. Grace saves. Truth frees. What is grace? What is grace exactly? Grace comes from the Greek, the root Greek word cherish, which means the undeserved kindness, favor, and goodwill of God. It's the love and kindness. I want you to get this one. It's the love and kindness. Scripture says it's the kindness of God that leads to repentance. It's not truth. It's not harshness. It's not. It's the kindness of God that leads to repentance. Not the truth that leads to repentance. It's the kindness of God's grace. And here's the key. It's undeserved. It's unmerited. There's nothing you can do to earn it. And the moment that you think you deserve grace, that is not grace. That's not grace anymore. That's pride. See, grace saves. Ephesians 2 says this. It says, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourself. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no man can boast. Here's what's so interesting to me. Jesus came full of grace and truth. And I like how John's writes this in his gospel because he he says grace first he says grace first which just leads me to a conclusion it leads me to a conclusion perhaps as jesus followers we are to lead with grace first then proclaim truth second lead with grace first let me illustrate it this way for you let me illustrate it this way imagine that we're back and our in-person gatherings, come on, it's going, it's going to happen again, friends, trust me. Uh, we're back in our in-person gatherings, and you're sitting in your row, you got your row of chairs. Let's just, let's just take a row of people at church that you're, that you're maybe sitting with, and I want you to just kind of visualize you looking down the row, and you see people. You see people sitting next to you. Who on that row do you think needs grace? Who on that row do you think needs grace? Let me just go through it, okay? We're going to use our imagination today. Imagination time at, at church today. Let's, we're going to go through these rows. I'm going to throw out some, some scenarios to you. And you tell me which, which one of these people you think need grace. Here, sitting on chair one right next to you. Let's start with this person. She's a, a, a mom and a wife. A mom and a wife. She's a great mom, fantastic wife. And she has a friend that she loves and hates all at the same time. 
And maybe you have friends like that too. She's jealous of her friend because of what her friend has achieved. And so she's really nice to her in her face, but she often gossips about her behind her back. Do you think that this woman in chair number one needs grace? Let's go next to her in chair number two. Chair number two sitting in the row next to you and chair number two is her husband. He's a great guy, fantastic guy. Great guy, really, really good, really, really good at business. He's, he's so good at business. In fact, he's so good, he kind of likes money a lot. Like, like maybe too much. You might, you might say, unfortunately, even though he's successful in business, he's not really successful in generosity. The guy's probably pretty greedy. Maybe he, he needs grace or, or, or truth. Next to him, sitting next to him in chair number three is an older lady who leads, a, who leads a small group at the church. Come on, she leads a small group. Very godly lady. Um, but she is still mad and bitter and upset at her mom. And she cannot forgive her. Her mom, and it's understandable, her mom was overbearing, controlling, and emotionally and verbally abusive. And she can't let it go. I wonder if she needs grace. And then in chair number four, the, the chair next to her, next to her is a, just a young guy. Young guy. And on the outside, he looks like he has it all together. But on the inside, I mean, he is just full of insecurities. He's so unsure of himself. He has so many emotional hurts that he constantly finds himself in self-destructive behaviors because it's the only way he knows how to cope with the emotional pain that he's feeling. And then in the last chair, Chair number five, the one on the very end, he's a really religious guy who honestly, he's not doing any of the stupid things that the other people are doing in the other four chairs. He's way beyond that. He's been walking with Jesus for a long time. And he's like, I mean, he's pretty holy. I mean, he's a holy dude, except, except he's looking down the road judgmentally at the other people and he doesn't like who some of those people even voted for, and he doesn't like the behaviors that they have, and he can't even figure out why they get to go to church and hear the gospel because they live the way they live. Ask yourself, out of these people, who needs grace? Who needs grace? The next question is, ask yourself right now, do you need grace? Do you need grace for your life? See, sometimes the church gets it wrong. And without meaning to, we end up doing, and what we end up doing is saying you have to behave first. Truth, 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 before you can belong. And this may be a lot like churches that you grew up in. Maybe you're watching and you grew up in churches like this. Or your, your idea of, of church was about behavior modification. There, there were all these implied rules. When you think of Christianity, there's, there's these implied rules. There's, these, there's a certain way you have to dress. You, you couldn't look bad, and, 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 you, and, you, and you had to look like you, you were a certain way. You have to act like a certain way. And even though you think church services are boring, you're just supposed to go because it's, there's implied rules. And if you do these rules, then you can go to heaven and avoid hell. If you behave and believe, then you can belong, and you can belong as long as you behave. Because that's what the Bible says. But friends, this is not the gospel. This is not the gospel that we see Jesus proclaim. This is not the kingdom of God that Jesus talks about in Mark 1, 14, where he says the time has come. Repent and believe the good news. Jesus says, just come to me. He says, follow me. He says, come to me as you are. Then I will transform you, change you, and give you life. And that's why sometimes we get it wrong and we need to adjust our thinking. We need to, we need to lead with grace. And we, and we want, and here you go, here at our church, we want it to be a place where people can belong before they believe. 
They can belong before they know how to behave. A safe place for people to belong even before their behavior matches up what they're beginning to learn about Jesus. See, the Apostle Paul says it like this in Romans 6.1. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? See, when we lead with grace, it gives people the opportunity to experience Jesus. And when people experience authentic Jesus, then behavior changes because Jesus is interested in our hearts. And when our hearts are arrested by the loving nature of a Jesus who died for our sins, rose again from the grave, defeated death, and gave us life, it changes something on the inside of us. See, we can't change our behaviors without changing our hearts. It's from the heart that God begins to work on us, and then the things around us fall into place. The challenge, the challenge with the truth to a post-Christian generation is that post-Christians are often skeptical about truth. They're skeptical, friends. The generation coming up, they're skeptical about Christianity. They're skeptical about this. They would tell you that anyone who claims to know truth is arrogant at best and maybe even worse, dangerous. Here's what we have to understand. The truth, the truth of the gospel, the truth of Jesus isn't restrictive. It's not oppressive. The truth that Jesus brings is freeing, is liberating, is absolutely and completely life-giving. If we go all the way back to, to Eden, if we go back to the garden, because the same God in the Old Testament is the same God that we see through Jesus, and we look at and we look at Eden, God looked at Adam and said, man, you are good, I did good, go and be fruitful and multiply, that's a good assignment that the Lord has given his people, amen, hallelujah, he, did, he said, you can enjoy anything in the garden, just stay away from one tree. Just stay away from one tree. Just don't eat that one tree. Because if you do, you're going to have spiritual death. In other words, his rule was not a limit on their fun. The rule was to protect them in order to set them free. Stay away from the danger. Enjoy the goodness of my creation. Enjoy what I have given you. His rules were loving, freeing, liberating, life-changing. Truth isn't just rules. Truth isn't just regulations or morals. Truth is a person. Truth is not what we do. Truth is who we follow. And Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Truth is a person. And who is the truth? And when you know the truth, John 8, 32 says the truth shall set you free. Truth is a person. Truth isn't just a bunch of regulations and rules that you have to follow to avoid going to hell. Truth gives you life and life to the fullest here and now. As we are agents of change to our broken world, bringing in the kingdom of God here on earth now, friends, this is truth. He's the truth. Grace saves and truth frees. Grace saves and truth frees. So if you think about the people in our illustration sitting next to you when we meet in person again, you think about these people. Which one needs grace and which one needs truth? And chair number one, the critical, jealous woman. And maybe you find yourself overly critical. Maybe you find yourself jealous and envious. And I want you to know you are so loved. You're so welcomed. You belong. Grace. But the truth is, envy rots your bones. And there's a way of healing and freedom and it's called love and blessing others, considering others better than yourself. You're welcome, but the truth is through Jesus you can overcome it. Cherry number two, her greedy husband. Hey, you are loved and you are valued and you are called by God, but the truth is the love of money, the love of money, don't get that verse wrong, the love of money is the root of many kinds of evil. There's a better way. 
the way of being more blessed is to give than receive. Chair number three, maybe I think a lot of us relate to this one, the unforgiving one. You're so gifted. You can lead and you can do things in such a great way. The Holy Spirit is working through you. you. There's grace poured out on you. But the truth is this. Unforgiveness is a significant problem in your life. You're called to forgive others as Jesus has forgiven you. And if you don't forgive, that can be one of the greatest hindrances in your intimacy with God. And I feel like right now the Holy Spirit dropped this, the story of the prodigal son where the father was waiting for the son to come back, meaning the father forgave the son before the son even uttered an apology. Don't wait to forgive someone because you're waiting to hear, I'm sorry. Forgiveness starts with you. Chair number five, this guy. He's the hardest one for me, if I'm being honest with you. He's so hard for me that sometimes I think I don't even want to be a pastor because these people drive me absolutely insane. If I'm just being transparent, maybe I'm too transparent with you guys sometimes, but if I'm just being transparent, these people drive me crazy. He's the judgmental one. He's the one that is loved and he's welcome here because I'm a mess and he's a mess. We're all just different kinds of mess. He's loved, he's loved, he's loved. But the truth is that pride often comes before the fall. The truth is if you exalt yourself, you're going to be humbled. But if you humble yourself, you're going to be exalted. Grace saves, truth frees. Grace saves, truth frees. And you may say, what about chair number four? You skip the fourth chair. I didn't skip that chair. I didn't skip chair number four. I live with chair number four every single day. Because chair number four is me. I'm chair number four. I'm the insecure one. I'm the one that was insecure and hopeless with no purpose until grace met me at the age of 15. I remember going up front to the altar with my brother and we both got on our knees and I met Jesus. I met grace face to face and it started me on the journey of knowing God and discovering the truth of God in my life. And here you go. I still need it. I need grace more now than ever before in my life. I'm still, I still find myself at the altar. I still find myself on my knees. I still find myself saying, God, I need you. I can't do it on my own. It is impossible. And I'm so thankful that Jesus came full of overflowing grace full of overflowing truth. Who is Jesus? He is the word made flesh, full of grace and truth. The truth of the chain breaking, sin shattering, intimacy building, life giving truth that God revealed to us and Jesus. And his grace is so undeserved, it's so scandalous, but yet Jesus comes and he comforts sinners. He loves the outcasts. He touched the lepers. He befriended the prostitutes. And I'm so thankful that his grace and his truth finds me today. It finds me today. You see, in a post-Christian generation, they are not rejecting Jesus. This post-Christian generation is not rejecting Jesus. They're rejecting a distorted view of who Jesus is from a church that has not gotten it right all the time. And here's what I want this generation to know. If I would say something to this generation, you're welcome here. You're welcome here. You, you belong here. You belong here no matter what you're facing, no matter what hurt you're carrying, no matter what baggage, no matter what sin, no matter what addictions, no matter what identity, no matter what you're dealing with, you're safe here and you're going to hear about the grace of Jesus that saves and the truth of Jesus that sets you free. And if you see Jesus who he really is, if you see him who he really is, you're going to want to leave everything and follow him. That invitation that Jesus made to the disciples thousands of years ago is the invitation made to you today. Leave everything and follow me. And friends, I'm telling you, it's the best life possible.
Bow your heads with me. Let's pray. God, we thank you. We thank you for your grace. And we thank you for your truth. We, we thank you for your grace that saves us and your truth that frees us. Even right now, I feel like there's some people watching that you need to experience this grace again. You need to experience this grace. You need to be reminded that Jesus loves you more than your biggest mistakes. He loves you more than your biggest fears. He's for you and not against you. And there's people here who need to hear his truth because you have been held down. You've been held down for way too long by things that you don't need anymore. And the truth is this, it's time for you to move on. It's time for you to move forward. So God, we come to you. We're in need of your grace. We're in need of your truth. It's in you that we trust. It's in you that we follow. In Jesus' name, amen.